by a fire which swept through a furniture store. It was the biggest blaze in the county since the Second World War. There was real fear that a large part of Maidstone town centre would be devastated by flames. But the skill of 200 firefighters confined the blaze to the furniture store where it began. In daylight, a family business was reduced to a pile of rubble. Fire is the great danger. We don't employ anybody that smokes. It's, um, it is the great threat and it is the great nightmare. The area remains closed until the remains of the building have been demolished. Fire investigators are still trying to establish the exact cause. And that's it. We'll be back tomorrow morning in business breakfast at 6.30. But now the weather with Rob McElwee. Good evening. There's a vigorous little depression to the west of Dundee, and that's giving the worst of the weather now over Grampian region. And this is what happened since the 6 o'clock news. This stuff has moved slowly south into Scotland. It's very cold air now, wrapping right around to Northern Ireland. But the rain hasn't left the south of the country. In fact, it's returning into the southwest of England. On closer inspection, you can see the rain is quite fragmented, but I can assure you on the mountains it's rather blizzard-like, and that weather coming back down through Malinhead towards Belfast will contain a good number of snow showers. There's the rain stretching up through the southeast of England, and here's an interesting lump into the southwest, interesting because it's going to move northeastwards. It's likely to track somewhere across the Midlands up and towards the north of England, and that'll leave some further snow on Pennine Roads. Great fun for gritters tonight, I can assure you. The strongest winds at the moment then are around the south of Scotland and up the eastern side, but we'll replace those as they go up towards the Northern Isles by fairly stiff southwesterlies, still across Wales and through the Channel, particularly just off the Kent coasts for the next 24 hours or so. But inland tonight, winds could be quite light, and with a big hole in the cloud at the moment, despite the fact this cloth is coming up across here, that means temperatures will drop. So it rains, and if there's any grit, it gets washed away, and then it turns icy. So whatever happens, be aware there could well be black ice in the morning anywhere in northern England, even north of that. Friday will be generally a day of blustery showers on a fairly stiff west or southwesterly wind. That's the simple picture, because it's never that simple. The majority of them will be down the western side of the country. Any of them could be heavy, certainly they'll be squally, and on the higher ground they'll give further snow. Best shelter, in other words, best sunshine, will be the east of any high ground, so probably the Manchester area could well get away with it, but generally it'll be the eastern side of England and Scotland, with some pleasant sunshine and temperatures, 6 or 7 degrees, that's about the average. On Saturday, it's still windy, but we replaced the showery regime with this area, which is likely to bring rain fairly quickly from the morning in the southwest across almost the whole country during the day. Now, that'll be in the north, extreme north on Sunday. The rest of us, sunshine and showers. Fancy a life on the high seas? There's a situation vacant on BBC Two in 15 minutes if you can smile, dance, sing and act non-stop for countless nautical miles. <laughs> BBC Sport brings you exclusively live coverage of rugby's toughest tournament, the Five Nations Championship, starting Saturday 12.15 on BBC One. Once upon a time, there were people who were terribly adventurous. If I make the Norfolk border within the hour, I usually reward myself with bacon and eggs. Utterly fearless. We did our big any idea who you are dealing with? Frightfully patriotic. I only ever planted English seeds in this garden. Jolly passionate. I am now completely naked. Yes. And really just awfully decent. You've got a lady friend, Bert. Well, I... Don't worry. I always carry spares. They were storybook characters, but they weren't in storybooks. Rowan Atkinson, Jennifer Saunders and Jim Broadbent in Heroes and Villains. Starts next Thursday at 9.30 on BBC One. This is BBC One, where we need you to give a hand to the long arm of the law.
Hello and welcome to what is the first Crime Watch UK of 1995 and the 106th programme altogether. As a result of those programmes, thanks entirely to information from viewers, police have now made a total of 393 arrests. And most of those have been for serious crimes which endanger public safety, such as armed robberies, rape attacks and murders. So with that to your credit as viewers, perhaps you can help put a stop to the activities of those responsible for the crimes we're appealing on tonight. In our first case, some of the details have been changed to protect people's identities. It's about an attack for which there's no known motive. It may have been a robbery which went wrong. Conceivably, the assailants may have intended to cause harm. Either way, it finished up as murder. Our reconstruction begins in September near East Ham in the capital. This is part of London's East End, where for centuries migrants have settled, the latest being largely Bengalis, Pakistanis and Bangladeshis. Atek Hussein came here in 1978 and went straight into the restaurant trade. He married Panna 12 years ago, and they and their children got a maisonette in East Ham off Newham Way. Atek was devoutly religious and devoted to his family. His other interest was his restaurant, an hour or more's journey from his home. The cook, he say, he can't start Monday. He owned it jointly with his brother, Malik. My brother and I start restaurant sure? business yes, no many problem. years ago. We bought a Wallingham Thanduri eight, nine years ago. Uh, what about the shopping list? Have shopping, you um, get some green chili and cool fee. Atmosphere at the restaurant the man, are all friendly. Some of them call Atek, you know, Chacha, mean uncle. Some of them call him a bhai, bhai mean brothers. I know. It's been a very long time. You've been on holiday. You have just come back. You've got a nice tan coming up. <laughs> Let me get your menus for you. Thank you. Thank you. Mom. Have you brushed your teeth? Yes. And you washed your face? Yes. Okay, in we get. Snuggle up. Okay, good night. Good night Don't Mom. stay up talking now. Good night, night Mom. I'm going, okay? Good night. Good night, Malik. Bye. Are you two finished? Yeah. Yeah. All right, then I'll just get changed and then we can go. After dropping off the two employees, Attic arrived home in Bernal's Avenue at about 2.30 a.m. be your father. He's got his keys. He wouldn't be ringing. Don't answer the door. Something's not right, Dolly. Phone the police. Attic? Attic! Attic! What happened? Attic! Attic! Kilo Oscar 1 receiving Kilo Oscar. Go ahead, over. Could you go to Bernard Avenue E6? A male collapse, over. Yes, all received. Kilo Oscar 1 out. When I turned into Bernard's Avenue, by the phone box where the first emergency call was made, I saw a pool of blood on the pavement. I then went to the 
house where the second call had been made and the door was closed. I attempted to open the door, but it was it, there was something behind it stopping me opening it. And it was then that I heard groaning and moaning from behind the door. A local resident noticed other people at the scene apart from the police. Oscar, confirm an ambulance has been called to Burnells Avenue E6 over. Excuse me, I don't know if it's got anything to do with what's going on here, but I've just seen a bloke hanging around on that corner. What, this side? Yeah, stay here, mate. Paramedics were there within five minutes of being called, but no one could have saved him. Atek had been stabbed through the heart. Tim Smells, as I said at the beginning, Atek had no known enemies, did he? No, that's right. He was a much-loved family man. Now, you've got a description of one of the guys who was running away. Two of them, and they were both Asian. You think, what else do you know about this chap? Yes, that's right. Uh, a witness saw two Asian men running away. Uh, we have a good photo fit uh, of one of them. What else do you know about him? He's uh, in his 20s. Anything more in description? As you can see, he's uh, medium height, medium build, with thick black hair, with a side parting, and uh, we believe he was wearing a dark bomber-style jacket. The white car that was seen at the end of the road, is that, do you think, significant, or, or are you looking for witnesses there? Are you looking to eliminate that? Yes, we certainly want to speak to the occupants of that car because uh, we believe it could be holding witnesses. It's a long time ago, this, September the 18th of, uh, sep Sunday, 18th of September. Uh, people will have thought of that as a Saturday night, of course, late on a Saturday night, four months ago. There was also th the man who was seen on the corner there. Again, he's probably a witness, nothing to do with the, the attack. You need to trace him, though. Yes, that's right, but uh, unfortunately, I haven't got a very good description other than uh, he was black, about five foot eight. But uh, again, we'd be treating him as, uh, at this stage as a witness. Now this uh, jacket, ordinary man's denim jacket with a very distinctive uh, logo, which is Portland College on the breast pocket. And it's got uh, this green lapel or collar and corduroy. Tell us how that was discovered and why yes, it's significant. That was found about a quarter of a mile away from the scene uh, in some uh, rough ground. Uh, we believed it was dumped there on the night because uh, the undergrowth was all wet and uh, that was dry. So we'd like to speak to anybody who knows this jacket, has seen this jacket or uh, seen anybody who uh, owned this jacket and uh, hasn't been seen wearing it since the date of the incident. Which is the 18th of September. There's a £5,000 reward which has been put up by the Community Action Trust. So please call us if you can. It's quite likely that people in the Asian community who want to help have been unable to because of language barriers. So because of that, a Saleti speaker is here to take calls this evening. If you can help, please ring the studio 0500 600 600 or you can contact the incident room at Stratford in East London where they speak five languages incidentally as well as English. That's 0171 275 5411. Notice we're now using the new dialing codes with an extra one in the number 0171 275 5411. Well, before we ask for your help on this month's photo call cases, I can tell you that as a result of last month's appeals, a viewer seems to have recognised this man who attacked a woman walking through Bedford Town Centre, breaking her nose and stealing her handbag. Police tell us that news on that case is imminent. The couple police needed to speak to in connection with a series of frauds are still being sought, despite news of a sighting in Turkey. And some 25 viewers called to say they recognise this couple. They may be able to help police investigating a series of frauds in West Sussex. And the programme has provided them now with four live lines of inquiry. And again, definite news is expected soon. We'll now hear a Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Hames with this month's appeal. Do you know this man? He's Kevin Francis Ashman and colleagues in London believe he may have important information about a sexual offence which took place in Ealing last year. On Friday the 18th of November a woman was raped after a night out at a club in West London. Kevin Francis Ashman is 31. 
five foot eight and of slim build. He's got short, dark, receding, curly hair and sometimes wears glasses. He also uses the names Michael Cuniff, Kevin Stanislaus and Kieran Leonard James. If you know where he is now, please ring us tonight. Do you recognise these men? Police in North Wales would like to speak to them in connection with a robbery at a clothes shop in Mould near Wrexham. On Friday the 11th of November at approximately 6.45pm, clothes worth thousands of pounds were stolen from Strides in Wrexham Street. Two days earlier, on Wednesday the 9th of November, these two men were caught on the security video acting strangely. One man in a blue peaked hat seems to be looking carefully around him. Both men had Merseyside accents and were in their mid-twenties. The man in the cap was approximately 5 foot 11 with blonde hair. The other was shorter with dark hair. If you know who they are or saw anything on the night of the robbery, then please call. Do you know this woman? Colleagues in South Wales would like to speak to her in connection with a series of deceptions across the country. In November last year, a woman befriended a young German student in London and stole her valuables. She adopted the student's identity and then moved on. Four days later, she did the same thing in Cardiff. Take another look at this photograph, taken from a discarded tube pass. The woman's five foot four, very slim, with long, dark red hair and blue eyes. She uses many aliases and speaks with a Scottish accent. She may come from the Irvine area of Strathclyde. If you know who she is or where she is, please call us tonight. And finally, do these two look familiar? Colleagues in Surrey would like to speak to them in connection with a robbery at a jeweller's. Here they are at ten past one on Wednesday the 9th of November in Walsh Brothers Jewellers, Oxted. After looking at several rings, one of the men assaulted the sales assistant. He then ran to the storeroom where he attacked another assistant, breaking her nose. Both men fled from the shop, taking the rings with them. The staff were left dazed and confused. The first man is five foot ten with dark, spiky hair. The second man is slightly taller. He's six foot with mousy brown hair. If you recognise either of them, or can help with any of our photo call cases, please call us now. That's the number 0500 600 600, free call 0500 600 600. Now there's another face that you ought to know about. Do look carefully because uh, you may have seen his picture around Christmas, but he still hasn't been found. If you do see him, please call the police immediately. If you know where he is now, please call us immediately. He's Philip George Manning. Three years ago, he tried to murder his wife. He was imprisoned, but he was released last autumn. On Christmas Day, his ex-wife was shot dead, and her new boyfriend was seriously injured with a machete type of knife. Philip Manning is thought to be in West London. At any rate, his car was found abandoned in Kensington on New Year's Eve. Did you see it there before then? But more importantly, do you know where he is now? Please call us here in the studio, 0500 600 600. Or you might bring the incident room in Evervale. That's on 01 495 350 548. That's 01 495, the code for Evervale, 350 548. Well, although they make the headlines, in fact, cases where somebody is raped by a stranger are very rare indeed. Having said that, this next appeal is unfortunately one of those cases. However, there's good reason to hope that the attacker will be identified tonight because in just the space of a few weeks before the rape took place and in the same area of the city of Bath, three other women were followed or accosted by a man and the descriptions that these women have given police are strikingly similar, not only to each other, but also to that of the man who committed the attack we're appealing on tonight. The names have been changed in our reconstruction which takes place on Monday, November the 14th. What's happened? I've, I've been raped. I'm really sorry, but we need to go through everything that happened. 
you to tell me from the beginning in your own time. I feel so dirty. I just, I just didn't know what was going to happen. I, I didn't know whether I'd see Paul again. When we arrived at the, the house that the police took us to, it, it seemed very unreal. Um, the people that we were with were complete strangers. I was just glad that my husband was there, that he could put an arm around my shoulder and give me a hug and tell me that I was going to be OK. Excuse me, the doctor's here. Are you all right to see the doctor now? Yeah. OK, let's go. We will carry on later. How's she doing? She's bearing up remarkably well. Good. We think this one may be linked to another incident which occurred in the same area a couple of weeks earlier. According to the incident report, the man is described as a white male, about 25 to 30 years of age, about 5 feet 7 inches tall. He had medium build, dark hair, and also a fringe. She was sufficiently nervous, she kept on stopping, hoping he was going to pass her. And this happened in the same road where Sarah was abducted from by the man who later raped her. Do you want to start from where you left work? Uh, about 5.30, I think. I just checked my diary to see what we have the next day. Everything's going OK. Hopefully I'll have the stats ready for tomorrow. I should convince Tom. <sighs> the better it's taken me a week. Why do I always end up doing this? I knew Paul would be at home by now. Monday is usually on night in. The man was about five yards from my car. He was about 25 to 30, five foot seven inches tall. At first, I thought he was staring at me. Hey, America, it's Christmas time. Hey, America. Move over. Bloody move over. Give me the keys. Put your head down. There was no point in shouting or screaming for help. All the houses have got double glazed and, and there were no cars around. Nobody could, could really come to my rescue. Um, so I just decided that I had to look after myself. I had to do what, what he asked me to do. And hopefully I would, I would come out the other end, really. Keep your head down. Name. Sarah. Where do you live? Pardon? Where do you live? He was very nervy in case I looked at his face. He um he kept pulling my hair if I, if I moved at all. So I really only got to look at him when he first got into the car. He's about twenty-eight to thirty-two, small to medium build, and he he definitely had a local accent. I was really scared. He kept on saying, "Don't look at me. Face the door." He was he was trying to be dominant, but it it came out all nervy. Then he he wound the seat of the car down, and. He put something round my wrist, something, something stretchy like a headband. Then he placed another band over my head and then he drove off again. I was really trying to pay attention to where we were going. I'm sure we made a right turn in Claverton, just on the Warminster Road. I kept on thinking, if I ever get out of this, I bloody well want to get you caught. I thought this is it. I'm never going to see anyone I love again. When your head. Oh, no! No! Matt, Matt, Matt! 
I could hear whistles. Men playing football. It's actually quite reassuring. From your description of the events yesterday evening, the gates and the incline here, there's no doubt in my mind this is the location where it happened. He's definitely the gate he brought me through. I remember catching my heel here. I'm sorry, I don't remember much about what route he took on the way back. I felt cold, dirty, disgusting. I tried not to cry or scream, to show no emotion, nothing. But inside I felt terrified. I didn't know what he was going to do with me next. Don't look at me. Don't follow me. Just stay where you are for five minutes. I feel scared every time I enter or leave my own home. I'm convinced that, that somebody, or him especially, is just going to appear from nowhere. Um, I also don't like being in the house on my own for any length of time, especially at night. Um, I feel frozen to the, to the spot, really, when I'm inside. Um, but I hope that in time that will, that will, that will go and I'll, I'll become normal again. I'll, I'll, I'll return to my normal self. Well, Ian Appleton, as I said earlier, you have high hopes that one of our viewers will recognise this man tonight. You've got such good, clear descriptions from the three other women who saw that man. Yeah. As a result of this attack, a number of young women have come forward and have talked about being followed in the Bathwick area. They all give a very much the same description. The description we've got is this. It's a white man. He's, about, he's a short man, about five feet seven. Slight to medium build. He's got short, dark hair with a fringe. He's got a local accent and, and is described as generally scruffy. And uh, one of those women, of course, um, encountered the man shortly before the attack took place on Monday the 14th of November. At about quarter to five, yeah. Right. Um, he actually followed her along Great Pulteney Street up towards Bathwick and uh, very, very nearly attacked her himself. So specifically what you're looking for is somebody who may have seen the man on that evening. Yes. There are four locations I'm interested in. There's obviously where she was abducted from, in Beckford Gardens. Then we've got the lay on the A36 where the vehicle pulled in. Uh, then we've got the rape scene itself, which is between the Bath University playing fields and the American Museum, a bit of woodland there. And then finally, at about 7.20, when he dropped her off in Forrester Lane, that's another location we're interested in. Any witnesses who were there in those locations, please come forward. And what's the sort of time span we're talking about? It's not much more than an hour, in fact, is it? Well, she was abducted at 10 past 6 in the evening and returned at about 7.20. She can actually remember looking at the clock in the car and seeing it turn from 7.19 to 7.20. Mm. Now, how likely do you think it is that other women will have encountered this man as well? I think it's very, very likely. It's almost as if he was building up to this attack. The, the offences were getting more severe as he went along. I think a number of other women have been followed. I'd like them to come forward. I think it's quite possible from the artist's impression that somebody may recognise this man. And what I'll say is this. Don't think that somebody else is going to make the call. If you feel that you recognise this man, then please make that call. Don't assume somebody else will. I know you do feel that somebody will come forward. Somebody does know who that is. Yes, I do. I feel very positive. Thank you. If you do recognise that description or you think you can help, I don't need to tell you how important it is to call. The number here in the studio is 0500 600 600 or you can call the police in Bath and that number is 01225 842 410. That's 01225, the code for Bath, 842 410. Well, we're getting so many calls, it's really hard for me to go through them all at the moment. On the Atak Hussein murder, we've got several people who've suggested names for the two Asian people, the eight men in their 20s who were seen running away. On photo call, we've really, we're being deluged by calls, but particularly on the woman who's wanted for a number of deceptions. Several people have rung in, including uh, a detective constable, and a name has come up repeatedly, Michelle Dillon. And if you know this woman under the name Michelle Dillon, or if you are Michelle, perhaps you could call us as quickly as possible. Now, to instant desk, uh, brief appeals on key police inquiries with Superintendent David Hatcher and Detective Constable Jackie Haynes. First, colleagues in Surrey want your help to solve a robbery. It happened at 12.40 on the 22nd of November when a security van was parked outside Bagshot Post Office on the High Street. 
This man approached the guard and threatened to shoot him in the back. The robber grabbed two post office bags before escaping down Cedar Close where he jumped into a moving getaway car. The car, a blue Rover 620SI, registration number L579WUY, had been stolen from Phipps Street in the City of London almost two months previously. It was later seen in Bachelor Street, Islington. Maybe you saw it between the 27th of September and the 22nd of November when it was used in the robbery. Five days later, it was recovered from Swinley Sawmills in Ascot. Take another look at the robber. He's in his mid-30s and between 5 foot 6 and 5 foot 8. He was wearing jeans and a grey jumper with a light blue weave. If you recognise him or the Blue Rover 620SI, please call us here in the studio or call the Surrey Police on 01 276 27131. That's 01 276, the code for Camberley, 27131. Our colleagues in Buckinghamshire would like to find this man who sexually assaulted a 10-year-old girl. At approximately 3.50pm on Monday the 19th of December, she was in Vash Lane, a busy road linking Little Chalfont with Chalfont St Giles. A man driving towards her stopped and forced her into the back of a dark green or blue coloured estate car, possibly a Volvo. Were you driving along the road or did you see anything? We're keen to speak to a person seen by the girl pushing a white coloured bike at that time. After a 20 minute drive, the girl was taken to an empty detached house where she was sexually assaulted. Afterwards, her attacker drove her to Gorlands Lane, just off Vash Lane, at about 5pm. If you recognise him, or you can help in any way, please phone Thames Valley Police on 01 296 396 0. That's 01 296, the code for Aylesbury, 396 If you live in the northeast of England, you may be able to help with our next incident case, desk case. The main clue, a silver grey Vauxhall Colton, was stolen from Hartlepool in August. It showed up two months later in Sheffield Town Centre. We'd had some new clocks come into stock. I'd unpacked them, and there were two very nice carriage clocks, which I wanted to put into the window. Right. So I'd gone outside to check which clocks I could take out to put the new ones in, because we like to get new stock into the window. I was leaving work at about 9.30 to go and move my car, which was parked on Wellington Street. I was outside H.L. Brown's when I heard a scream come from inside the shop. Everybody on the ground, now! Quick, get the police. There's a robbery next door. I'm going to speak to the car. I stood perhaps a minute or so, um, studying the window. Um, and then I walked back along Leopold Street and into the shop. I didn't realise at first what was happening because I'd turned towards Therese straight away and then all of a sudden the man with the gun came towards me. I thought that he was going to shoot me because I'd walked in on them and as he came towards me with his finger on the trigger I thought, well, this is it. I've had it. They're going to shoot. He's going to shoot me. The man that was taking the jewellery out of the window was throwing things into the bag. You could hear them all clashing together. I felt nervous. I was a little bit apprehensive that if he could see me, he might realise that I'd seen him, but I was totally focused on getting the registration number. When I got round the corner into Leopold Street, I could see there was a silver grey Vauxhall car parked there. I immediately thought it must be the getaway vehicle, there was somebody sitting inside it. I got a pen out of my bag and started to write. As I was doing that, two men came past me, I moved out of their way, and I just had to stand there while I watched them get into the car and the car drive away. When officers arrived five minutes later, the robbers had abandoned the car half a mile away. The gunman's described as late 30s, early 40s, about 5 foot 9, medium build, wearing a distinctive wig. 
there's a substantial reward on offer for information leading to the recovery of the jewellery, so if you can help in any way, please call the Incident Room in Sheffield on 01142 523 819. That's 01142, the new code for Sheffield, 523 819. And finally, on Incident Desk, officers would like your help to solve a fatal stabbing in North London. 50-year-old Andrew Machenji finished his night shift as a doorman at the Africa House Club in Stoke Newington at 8am on Sunday the 5th of June. At 8.45, he withdrew cash from the Halifax Building Society. Shortly afterwards, though, he was seen staggering into Kingsland High Street. He'd been stabbed in a car park between Gillette Street and Bradbury Street at around 9am. Officers would like to identify two men who were seen running down Bradbury Street and into St Jude Street. They were both described as black, in their early 20s, and between 5 foot 9 to 6 foot. One of the men had a goatee-style beard. If you were in the area at the time of the attack, or can help in any way, please call the incident room on 0171 275 5453. That's 0171 275 5453. And of course, for all our cases tonight, you can ring us direct here in the studio on 0500 600 600. That's 0500 600 600. Lots of business people trade in cash. Mostly it's not a problem, but occasionally it does make them rather vulnerable. And what's worse, if they do lose money in a crime, they're rarely covered by insurance and their business can be crippled. In our next case, a coin dealer took every routine precaution when handling cash but he nearly lost his livelihood, and indeed it could have cost his life. My business is special to me because it enables me to make a reasonable living out of something which is always regarded as a hobby. One of them's got the most unusual definition. Can you remember those commentary details? Mm -hmm. um, have a look at the journalist. It enables me to work from home, enables me to work for my wife, which is something which I would not be able to do were I in normal employment. I was travelling along the stretch of road on my way to work at about 8.30 in the morning, which I do each day, just in an everyday state of mind. I remember seeing a red car that was parked well over onto the grass verge. It seemed to me the car was parked there for a reason, perhaps watching something, and it stuck in my mind. Forty-five. Mm-hmm. Uh, sorry, who gave you my name? Right, you know, John. What have you got for sale? A gentleman with a strong northeast mm -hmm. accent he gave as a reference a friend of mine I've done business with for 20 years, and he seemed very, right. very genuine. Well, what are they? Well, I'm mainly British, uh, Carotius and Electus. We made arrangements to meet to view the collection. He suggested Scotch Corner Roundabout. It's a traditional meeting place for people who are sort of halfway house. And he told me that there was a restaurant across the way. There's a Deals Wheel Lodge on the left-hand side. I'll meet you in the car park at 7 o'clock tonight. I'll be in the Red Sierra. I have a friend I've known for about 20 years called Adj. We both went to the same coin club and we've developed a strong friendship over the years. He arrived at my house, I think, about 5 o'clock. really appreciate you coming over at such short notice, Adj. It's a hell of a long way and I really didn't fancy doing it on my own. No problem. We had a cup of coffee and he got himself ready and had a sandwich like because I'd not eaten since dinner time. And we just hopped in the car and drove up like. Uh, I mean, having mentioned JW, he went on to talk about some of the coins that he got. And he obviously knows something. Well, he was but, uh, more or less hyped up, awesome. wondering what, what coins he was going to yeah. see and whether he was going to get a good buy out of it. Just right for the fair next week. That good? Yes, I really do think so. I usually take the dogs for a walk about that time. It's just something that's very relaxing, I think. Switch off from work. It wasn't too dark that night. 
As I came out of the village, there's a track that goes down into the fields. And I passed that and carried on up the road. We arrived at about five to seven. I was a little perturbed that the restaurant did not in fact seem to have opened, although there were lights on in the downstairs room. Nobody about. Are you sure this is the right place? Sure, they always turn up. A car pulled into the car park, swung round and drove straight at us, so it was head on to our side. And then he just waited a minute with his headlights on. Um, and then it reversed back behind us. Um, so I looked at my mirrors, you know, I couldn't see him because he was parked a bit off to one side. how to fill in my time while he was going through this collection of coins. Want a big journey up? Fine. Help yourself. somebody had thrown something in the face. So I'll stumble across to the road to try and get out, basically. <laughs> My face was just on fire. I mean, I've never experienced any pain like it. I don't know exactly what's happened next. I must have been unconscious because I realised I was coming round, lying on the floor. About halfway up the road, a GTI-type vehicle came rather fast down the road. It wasn't just going fast, that was racing speed. Uh, I've just been attacked by two men. I'm in a car park. Dale's Way Lodge, it's just near Cot Scotch Corner. As I walked back down, a fire caught my attention. And then I realised as I got further down the road, the thing was on the track that I'd passed on the way up the road. And I could then definitely tell it was a car because I could see the driver's door was open. And at that point, I started jogging for her. Two suspects have made off in a red Ford Sierra. Last direction of travel towards Scotch Corner Hotel. 4-1 over. Get those details off to the Sarge. Yep, okay. In the ambulance, I suppose I was feeling initially shocked and outraged and wondering whether my jaw was broken. I was concerned about Ad because he'd obviously suffered some quite severe injury to his eyes. And if anybody had said to me before it happened, you'd have gone through all this trauma and upset, and I said, don't be silly, it's, you're all right, he's finished, but it's not. It lasts a long time. I've been going through that every night since, not being able to sleep, worrying about it, and. Uh, it's a very nerve-wracking business. Well, it's worse than that. If Adge Wooden Stanley hadn't been wearing glasses, he would have been blinded. That's right, yes. Tell me, Alan Ankers, you've got quite a good description of one of the men. The main offender is described as a white male, 5 foot 11 to 6 foot in height, very emaciated features with sunken cheeks. He has brown hair, and he possibly had a light-coloured moustache. At the time of the robbery, he was wearing camouflage clothing and he spoke with a northeast accent. What do you know about the red car that they had? We strongly suspect that the vehicle used was a red-coloured H-registered Ford Sierra XR 4x4 stolen from Jesmond, Newcastle upon Tyne on the 31st of January 1994. January? Last January? That's correct. Now this robbery was in November. That's right. We're obviously keen to know the whereabouts of that vehicle from the time of its theft to its use in the robbery. Okay. 
the uh, number plate G793RCU, at least you think that's the, the, the number plate on that night, that's on a legitimate vehicle, we should make that clear. Yeah, that, that's, that's right. The offender was making, somebody was making a phone call, obviously from that phone box in, in Sunderland. Um, it was on Shields Road, uh, near, near Dovedale Road. What time was that? Tell us a little more about that for potential witnesses. That person made two calls from the phone box in Shields Road, Sunderland, at about 10 a.m. on the morning of the robbery. He had a strong jury accent, and it appears he also had knowledge of metal detecting and coin collecting. OK, now, we didn't show it in the reconstruction, but there was another clue, possible clue at any rate, a C-registered Ford Orion, a blue car that was seen nearby. Why is that significant? The week previous to the robbery, a, a witness saw the Orion parked on a lane three miles from the Dalesway Lodge, very, very close to the farm track where the getaway car was subsequently found burnt out. OK, well, if you can help in any way, please call us 0500 600 600. Who, with a Geordie accent, uh, obtained a Red Sierra, maybe has a history of violence, and could have been around Scotch Corner on Thursday, the 3rd of November, shortly after 7 o'clock, and suddenly came into quite a lot of cash. If anything fits in that picture, please call 0500 600 600. Or you can call the police in North Yorkshire on 01 609 789 008. That's 01 609, the code for North Allerton, 789 008. Well, we're getting a lot of calls in today. We've had names suggested for the murder of Atek Hussein and several calls on that denim jacket. All the photocall cases seem to be having good information. There's a lot of stuff to go on there by the look of it. And uh, we're getting suggestions for the man who raped the woman, the businesswoman in Bath. And also, I'm just getting information, we've had an interesting call on the Chalcons St Giles case on Incident Desk. If you can add to that information or you think you can help on any of tonight's cases, please do ring us. We have 40 lines here. So if you don't manage to get through straight away, please Please do try again. The crimes we've seen tonight are the exception, not the norm. Let's put a stop to them all together if we can. The number is 0500 600 600. Our lines are open for another two hours. We'll be back with more news on progress with Crime Watch Update at a quarter past 11. If you can't stay up till then, we'll bring you more news in our next Crime Watch, Thursday the 16th of February at our normal time, 9.30. Whatever happens, don't have nightmares, do sleep well. Good night. Good night. James, pick up Jenny, take one. For the nannies, one it's working. For the parents. So what do you want to happen? It's not. We probably have to give the house back next month. Oh, this is nice. We'll call this a feature, shall we? Get to the dry cleaners. I should be at school for afternoon register. Then tea for these two. You played the game, Lisa, and then you made a mistake. Then more tea. I was set up by those little monsters. Then bath. Then tears. Before bedtime, Sunday, 9.35 on BBC One. I shouldn't really be here. The BBC tries to ensure that its programmes do not treat people involved in them unfairly. The Broadcasting Complaints Commission considers complaints of unfair treatment and unwarranted infringements of privacy if the complaints come from the individuals or groups directly affected. The address is P.O. Box 333, London SW1, WOBQ. And now on BBC One, question time. On question time tonight, former Conservative Minister Edwina Curry. Shadow Transport Secretary Michael Meacher. Liberal Democrat Environment Spokesman Matthew Taylor. And Head of the Central London Tech, Gwyneth Flower.
Welcome to Question Time, which comes tonight from Southampton, where our audience is fired up as ever to put questions and argue about the main issues of the day with a panel who, as I always remind you, do not know the questions that are going to be put to them. Let's have the first question straight away. It comes from Richard Manley, who is a company <coughs> director. Following last night's Commons vote, does Britannia still rule the waves? Michael Meacher. Well, uh, I do think that the government's uh, appeasement of uh, Spanish and French fishermen uh, in the way it uh, allowed uh, those countries to get access uh, to, fishering, to, to, to fishing uh, around the Irish box uh, between southwest uh, England right up to Scotland uh, and to produce unsustainable pressures uh, on limited fish stocks in those areas is very serious. Uh, the vote uh, last night was an attempt to reverse what is disastrous um, for the fishing industry. Uh, we did get the support of a number of uh, Tory uh, votes, uh, who, people who are directly connected with it, uh, and felt forced, I think, to support us. But, of course, the majority of the Tory party obeyed the whip. Uh, 